I'm Dr. Neha Bhatta, and welcome to our four-part interview with Dr. Daniel Claw about the state of the art in the management of patients with chronic pain in a post-opioid world. Dr. Claw is a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he's running the largest clinical trial to date in people with chronic back pain. Our series will look at best practices for pain management referrals, how opioids fit into the treatment armamentarium, ways to optimize patient communication and expectation management when it comes to pain control, and approaches to multidisciplinary care. Hello, today we're talking to Dr. Daniel Claw, a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, who is running a major trial on treatments for chronic back pain. We're talking today about managing back pain in the post-opioid world. Thank you so much, Dr. Claw, for taking the time to be our resident uh, pain consultant today. Managing chronic pain can lead to a lot of burnout and helplessness in the clinic setting. That's the reality with some of the modalities that patients are requesting, still confusion about what is optimal for a particular type of patient, this feeling that we're not really helping people um, get better and that it's always sort of, whenever patients come in, that's always still their, their chief complaint. How would you advise providers to think about that and to sort of settle into their role as communicators about better strategies without the burnout? Well, the first thing is to broaden the number of other providers that you get involved in these individuals care as we the evidence base for all of these non-pharmacologic therapies being effective in chronic pain increases and increases um, and as third-party payers begin to reimburse for more and more of these therapies it's really difficult to manage chronic pain patients if you're trying to do it alone on an island but if you can identify you know the good physical therapists in your community that are going to really work with people to give them an exercise program that they can use at home, find a pain psychologist that can offer some cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, some, some CBT for pain in the subset of patients with trauma, um, give them the emotional awareness or the neural reprocessing therapy for that specific subset. But as you start to identify more and more of these non-pharmacologic therapies that you want your patients to try, each of those has a set of providers and they can be incredibly helpful so that you as the PCP don't really feel overwhelmed um, by the, the, the you're it, that you're, the, you're the only one. And, and a lot of these individuals have more time to spend um, and they have more one-on-one, -on -one, so if you will, face or really in-person time um, than you do as a primary care physician in the current healthcare system. Um, so and a lot of those providers have become really good at doing sort of amateur cognitive behavioral therapy and goal setting and some of the other kinds of things that you need to do when you manage chronic pain patients. So try to find that other group of people that, that you can send your patients to that are going to be offering some of these non-pharmacologic therapies and they'll really help you manage these individuals? I think a couple of things come up for me as you say this. One is that we have to maybe broaden thinking about pain management, not just as multimodal strategies, but multidisciplinary strategies. So I think to your point, I think that's really important. I also worry and wonder about health equity concerns just because just as overburdened and overpaneled a lot of primary care providers are, we're seeing it's very difficult to get into physical therapy or to get into a setting where you'd be able to uh, receive CBT um, for your pain. So any thoughts on, on those types of considerations? That's a huge problem. Uh, and, you know, our group and a lot of other groups in the pain space are developing websites and smartphone apps and things like that to try to actually get some of these things directly to individuals with pain not j just for the reasons that you stated, but also so that persons with pain don't have to become a patient. They don't, because our healthcare systems often make pain worse rather than better. There were some great articles in The Lancet about five years ago 
talking about low back pain and that in different countries, the healthcare systems for different reasons have a tendency to actually make low back pain worse because they do too much surgery or they immobilize people and, uh, or things like that rather than uh, not just not make them better. So I think we've over-medicalized chronic pain in some settings and a lot of what we're trying to sort of lead people to are things that are parts of like wellness programs. The, the NIH um, Integrative Medicine Institute, the institute director talks about whole person health a lot. And I really think that these integrative approaches, interdisciplinary integrative approaches are what we really have to be using for chronic pain patients. And um, I, you know, I tell pain patients that I don't know whether acupuncture, acupressure, mindfulness, um, the, what, five different forms of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, yoga, tai chi, I don't know which of those is going to work, but I know that about one out of three individuals that tries each of those therapies now gets a benefit. And so what I really should be doing um, most is incenting people and motivating people to keep trying some of those non-pharmacologic approaches that they haven't yet tried because when they find one that works for them, then they will integrate it into their day-to-day -day life. And the other trick I would use for um, primary care physicians or anyone managing chronic pain patients is don't try to incent a pain patient to go try a new non-pharmacologic therapy or start an exercise program because you want their pain score to go from a six to a three. And sent them because you asked them about what are two or three things that you're not able to do now because you have chronic pain that you'd really like to be able to do. You'd like to play nine holes of golf. You'd like to be able to hug your grandchild. You'd like to be able to do this. And use those functional goals um, that, that, that are patient-driven to motivate your patients to do these things because th that will work a lot better. Th those are... Um, Again, any of us are inherently more likely to take the time and the effort to do some of these non-pharmacologic therapies if, if, if it's for a reason that internally motivates us. I think that's great. I'm very privileged to work within the VA healthcare system, and I think that there's just been a huge shift within uh, VA healthcare to provide these ancillary services, whether it's yoga, tai chi, acupuncture, as, as an adjunct to um, the pain management strategy. Um, and I also, what comes up for me as you're saying that is sort of grounding that the, the pain, instead of relying on a pain score, which can be objective and different from patient to patient and with, even within patient, to a SMART goal that is almost more objective when it's functional. So can you, you know, this is your goal is to walk two blocks to the mailbox. Can we achieve that um, as, as part of your pain control strategy? I so appreciate you taking the time to uh, be our pain consultant today. I really appreciate our discussion, and I'd like to hand it over to you for any final thoughts. Maybe the other thing I'd add is when you're seeing chronic pain patients, a lot of them are going to have comorbid sleep problems. They're going to have comorbid problems with fatigue, memory problems, because especially the central nervous system driven forms of pain that we now call nosoplastic pain. But look at those as therapeutic targets. Like if you're befuddled because you've tried a lot of different things for pain in this individual you've been seeing for a while, focus on their sleep um, and focus on getting them more active. Don't use the word exercise because that scares chronic pain patients, but focus on getting them more active. But there's a lot of different tactics and strategies that you can use to try to, again, motivate the patients to, to try, especially some of these new non-pharmacologic approaches that, whose evidence base continues to increase. Thank you so much again to Dr. Claw for joining us and being our pain consultant, um, really helping us think about managing back pain in the post-opioid world.